Um, we're going to be talking about responsive typography with uh, variable fonts. And what I mean by responsive typography isn't like traditional responsive web design where you move the browser and stuff change. Um, more about how we can make our typography respond to uh, various inputs, um, different API sensors, that kind of thing. Uh, but first, what I'll do is explain what variable fonts are. Before I do that, my name is Mandy. You can find me on Twitter, Mandy underscore Kerr. If you have any questions, things don't make sense, my DMs are open. Most of my demos are up on CodePen at um, Mandy Michael, so uh, you can go and check those out later. They're in a, a collection. This is my dog, Jello. Um, you will find out why this is important, uh, why I had to tell you that my dog's name is Jello, because uh, if I didn't, things would get very confusing later. So I wanted to explain how I fell into um, playing with variable fonts. A couple of years ago, I started making text effects with uh, HTML and CSS. And uh, I came across variable fonts as a result of making text effects. And it became clear to me very quickly that variable fonts offer us some unique opportunities that standard fonts have never been able to provide us. And the reason for that is that a variable font is one font file that acts like multiple fonts. And what I mean by that is at the moment, when you're loading fonts into your site, say you have, I don't know, six font weights. You would have these as separate individual files, and you would load them in separately. With a variable font, all of that information exists within one file. And the way that this is accomplished comes down to how the font itself is made. So a variable font can contain one or more axes, and each of these axes represents different variations of extremes um, for a different uh, style. So for example, a weight axis might range from a lightweight to a really heavy or, or black weight. Now you can still have all of the standard stuff in between that you're used to, like regular, bold, that kind of thing. They're known as named instances. But you can also interpolate between these values, which means you have access to all of the values in between as well. This means that we can animate between the styles, which is something that we've not been able to do with fonts before. It would be really janky because you couldn't get those smooth transitions. But we're not just limited to a single axis at a time. A variable font can contain thousands of axes, and you can uh, interpolate between the combinations of the axes as well. So whether it's weight or width, like standard stuff like that, or if it's something a little bit different, um, this font is called Decovar. It's by David Ber Berlow. It's an experimental variable font. It's one of my favorites because it has a lot of creative axes that you can play with. Now, I'm going to show you some examples with Decovar a bit later, but before I do that, I wanted to get the um, practical implementation stuff out of the way that people always ask. First thing, browser support. You can totally use them now unless you have to support Internet Explorer. If you do have to support Internet Explorer, you can use CSS feature detection to fall back to a standard font. Um, so, you know, there, there are ways around it. The only caveat to these green ticks is that for Firefox, um, you need to have High Sierra and above on a Mac, for example, uh, because uh, Firefox relies on the operating system to render the variable font. Chrome does not. So you know, High Sierra is a couple of operating systems ago, so that should be less of a problem. But um, it does require uh, more modern operating systems to, to render the specification. When it comes to using variable fonts, it's the same way that we use fonts now. We use font face. The main difference is how we render, uh, sorry, how we define descriptors. Uh, oh, sorry, the variations for descriptors, like font weight, font stretch, and font style. So with a standard font, say you had a regular weight and a bold weight, you would do one font face block for regular and one font face block for bold, and you would keep doing this until you had all of the, the styles that you need. With a variable font, you just have to define a range. So in this case, 200 to 700. And then when you reference it in your CSS, you can pick any number from 200 to 700, including decimal places, so 658.756 is a random number, but you can pick anything. 
Now, this is really, really good for something like weight because we have a CSS property for it. This is known as a registered access, and all that means is it's defined in the specification. There are five registered axes at the moment, weight, width, slant, italic, and optical size, and they're all mapped to pre-existing CSS properties. If you wanted to do something custom, like decovar, which I just showed you, we need a new CSS property, and that's called font variation settings. Now, font variation settings will allow us to define as many registered and custom axes as we need. And the way that you use them is you define a four-character string, which in the case of custom axes is determined by whoever made the font. So in this case, me, which is why it says Jello. Uh, and then you give it a um, associated number value. And you can just separate these by a comma and add as many as you like. You can use a registered axis in font variation settings for something like weight, it is WGHT. However, I would recommend that you don't. There are some bugs in font variation settings, but the main reason is that it's just harder. Uh, we already know how to use things like font weight and font style, and if you're doing fancy stuff, font stretch and font optical size. So don't change what you're doing already just to use a different property. Keep everything the same, and then when it's custom, use font variation settings for that. So using them is pretty much the same as what we're doing now with a, you know, a couple of slight changes. When it comes to fonts on the web, there's a whole talk in that um, for performance on its own. For a variable font, there's a couple of things about them that does make them quite good for performance. But they're still fonts, so you still need to have a good font performance strategy, things like font display, subsetting, compression, that kind of stuff. There's two things that I wanted to mention about variable fonts, though, that um, are good for performance that are kind of unique to the fact that they're variable fonts. And the first one is reducing the number of font requests. So one of the ways that we maintain good font performance is trying to not request as many fonts to download. At the moment, when we think about reducing the number of font requests, we'd weigh up the cost of design over the cost of performance. And we'd have to justify the cost of uh, adding new fonts before we add any more styles in because of the impact that it would have on the performance of the site. But with a variable font, because all of the data can exist within one file, simply by using a variable font, you reduce the number of font requests just because that's what it does. So not only do we reduce the font request, but we also gain the benefit of all of the interpolated values as well, giving us more design opportunity. Of course, the problem then becomes if all of the data is in one file, what does that do to file size? People are like, it must be huge, right? My answer to this is not necessarily. Um, in my experience, that's my terms and conditions, uh, variable fonts are either on par or better than the combination of your standard font weights, for example, uh, that you might be loading in your site uh, just generally. And an example of this is Source Sans Pro. So this is the file sizes for the WAF 2 versions. A single weight of Source Sans Pro is 111 kilobytes. The variable font is 112. The variable font has that single weight plus all the other weights plus all of the interpolated values. So for an extra kilobyte, you get like a significant improvement in design opportunities. Now, Source Sans is a big font. It has lots of language support, so I would subset this. And standard fonts do subset a little bit better than um, variable fonts, although not significantly. But even if you had two weights, a regular and a bold, which is pretty common, the variable font is still smaller than the two standard weights combined. So you can get some good performance benefits by switching to a variable font. But this is obviously going to depend on the fonts you use, your website, styles that you're using. So like, don't quote me on this and come back to me later and be like, Mandy, you said that my performance would be better if I used variable font. I can't tell you that in every scenario, but there's an opportunity there that it might be better. So at this point, what I want to, uh, to get into is the fun part. This is the bit that I like in my talk. We've done all of the sort of serious housekeeping. Um, if performance can be better, 
even let's just assume our performance doesn't change, but all of a sudden we have a lot more options for our styles in our fonts. Much more flexible choices. This means that we can start to shift our focus. We can experiment with creating better experiences for the people using our websites. And creativity can determine our choices. We don't have to start to trade off design for performance. We can have both. This is something we don't often get, right? It's always like, oh no, you can't have an accessible website and a beautiful website, or you can't have a performant website and a beautiful website. I'm telling you that you can. Our variable fonts will allow you to do that, but also just generally you can. Like if someone tells you that, they're wrong. Um, so for example, this uses 13 different font weights, many of which don't exist in the standard font. So you can see that we kind of start to gain some more flexibility. Designs which would have previously been a very heavy burden on performance are now completely possible. This means that the tone, the intent, the rhythm, the meaning of our words can be changed and they can be represented more effectively with less worry over the impact of loading in too many font weights. This is what I refer to as jello ipsum and I use it quite extensively. Um, it's pretty much just words that rhyme with jello and a little bit of story about, about him. So you get to learn about him as you go. Speaking of Jello, um, we can embrace the learnings of print design, right? When we start to do this, we can combine variable fonts with things like CSS grid and blend modes and shapes and clip path and text shadows and all of those great things. And we can represent our content in more interesting and more engaging ways. But unlike print design, we can embrace the interactivity and the flexibility of the web. Because variable fonts can have the interpolated range of values, we can create animations or transitions, and we can do that with techniques that we're probably already familiar with. Like this one. This is a H1 and some CSS. It's editable, selectable, searchable, accessible via a screen reader. You can copy and paste it. And it only requires a little bit of CSS to make the actual animation work. Previously, if we were going to do something like this, it would have to be SVG or Canvas or something like that. The CSS to do that is this. I have a font family, Deco Bar, by David Berlow. David did, does, he's amazing. He deserves all the credit in the world for this awesome font. We have an animation property, runs infinitely. Um, keyframe, I've just called it grow. It's got two states. We have two axes for this effect to work. One's called inline, and one's called skeleton worm. David named them, I don't, I don't know. Um, skeleton worm starts at zero, and then goes to 1,000 in the next keyframe, and then it just loops back around. And literally, that's it. Uh, I added a bit of extra CSS for um, texture, but it's a background image and some text shadows. The heavy lifting is really done by the font here. David kind of did all the work for me, and I just had to swoop in and add a bit of CSS and then share out this awesome demo on Twitter and wait for people to go, ooh, which they did, and I was very excited about. But I think this is really amazing. Doing this with text is something we've never been able to do before. And there's lots of stuff that you can do with text and variable fonts. Um, with just a little bit of CSS, maybe a bit of JavaScript. This is uh, a handwriting font um, by a foundry called Underwear, who are doing really awesome stuff with handwriting. You should check them out. When I started making text effects originally, um, I would layer fonts a lot, but the problem with that is that you're loading multiple fonts in just to get one effect. But with variable fonts, it's only one font, and you can layer things to create the effects um, in a very similar way. You can do hovers and transitions with your weights or your widths, um, which, like I said earlier, is something that we weren't able to do before. Um, I'm not really sure how to describe this. I just think it's really cool. Uh, it's called Wind VF. Uh, I, every time I do this talk, I'm like, I'm going to figure out a good use for this, and I still, I still haven't yet. 
Um, you can create weird things like this. This is actually a Google font from um, the V2 version of the Google Fonts API. They have variable fonts. There's about a dozen of them. Um, so you can experiment with them with Google Fonts as well. I, I have a blog called variablefonts.dev that has a tutorial on how to make this. So um, you can go check that out if you want to have a play. Or you can do something like this. Um, this is Decovar again, and this is my favorite demo. And the reason that I love it is because I love how the text shadow disappears with the text. Uh, it's very, very beautiful, um, and I just like to look at it for a long time. When I first made it, Chrome did not like it at all. Originally, um, it would make my laptop get very warm, um, but uh, they have fixed the performance of it now, so it doesn't get as hot anymore, which is nice. Um, as hot, I said, yeah, it's a little bit. Uh, so this demo, um, this is Marshmallow, my dragon. Ooh. Away from that mic. Um, so when I started making text effects, uh, I eventually got bored of the fact that they were just there. So I started experimenting with alternate inputs. If this doesn't work, I have a, a backup of a button, but that's boring. Um, so I'm going to say a word to Marshmallow, and he is going to breathe fire in that word using my awesome variable font. Fire. Yay. So this uses um, Decovar again. It's like a bunch of axes. Um, and what I love about this uh, demo in particular is that I always wanted to create fire text, but I could never get it to look like fire. So instead, what I did is I made the rest of it look like the fire text I could make. Um, but I like how it kind of, the text itself becomes part of the illustration and the interactivity. And although you can do this with Canvas and SVG, we've never really been able to tie our actual content into designs. It's always kind of added on um, as, a as like a layer, and it doesn't blend as well into the background. But with variable fonts, you can start to tie those things together uh, a lot more effectively. Thank you, Marshmallow. That was spectacular. So it's not just that these are beautiful or cool effects, right? What they demonstrate is that as developers and designers, we can control the font itself. And that means that variable fonts allow typography on the web to adapt to the flexible nature of our screens, our environments, and our devices. This means we can also make the most of things like uh, dark mode, for example, to change the way um, our fonts are represented in different uh, color schemes or environments. So for example, we could change the um, axis of one of our fonts in a prefers color scheme media query. And that could give us something like this. It oozes because it's dark mode. Right? I made this at Halloween and thought it was hilarious. I still think it's hilarious. So this is a bit of a silly example. But more practically, we can modify the contrast and the styles of our text to ensure better legibility. When we think about um, color contrast and dark modes and things like that, we're usually thinking specifically about color. And that's obviously important. But the colors that we use can affect the way our text is red and how legible it is. So you might actually need to change the weight a little bit or the width a little bit or the optical sizing to make it more legible in a darker uh, interface. But also, if you think about this from a user preference perspective, if a variable font is available to developers and designers, it also means it's available to our users. So for those people that need to make custom style sheets for accessibility reasons, it means that they can customize the way the fonts are rendered to suit their specific needs. And that's very exciting to me. I like the idea that we can give our users options for their own preferences. And I know there's a variable font being developed at the moment uh, that helps people with dyslexia to change the way that um, let, how far letters are apart, the shapes of them, so that they can read content better. And this is very important for critical interfaces or public websites like governments, hospitals, those kinds of things. So rather than designing for, I guess, the average, you can give people the opportunity to customize it to their needs. But also it means that we can change our design um, and our typography to adjust to things like screen width. 
that might allow us to tweak font weight, width, optical size, or other axes to be more readable on larger or smaller screens. So where the viewport is wide, we might have more detail, or when the viewport is smaller, you might want it to be heavier so it's easier to read. Or, I mean, if you want things to fit in a confined space, like a box, um, you might be able to do that too. I'm sure you can think of some good examples of where that might be applicable. Another example is when you have designs which are designed to fit at a certain breakpoint. In this case, I'm reducing the width of the heading as the viewport gets smaller so it doesn't wrap onto a new line. This means I can maintain the integrity of my design and I can determine when the text is going to wrap or stack on new lines. Now, I did this with a bit of JavaScript, and I want to show you how it works, because once you have it, you can do a lot of cool things. So we need a couple of things. The axis range, so in this case, 200 to 900 font weight, and the event range, so viewport for this, 320 to 1440. We get our current viewport width, window.inner width, or something. Then we need to convert that to a decimal. So we take the current size, we minus the minimum, we divide that by the maximum minus the minimum size, and that'll give us our decimal. We take that decimal place, we multiply it by the minimum weight minus the maximum weight, and then we add the maximum weight on. Then you update it in your CSS, however you want to do it. I'm using CSS custom properties because they're amazing. Whack it all in a function, it looks something like this. Don't worry about the code, I will share my slides later. There's also, it's on, on GitHub as well, so you can just copy it from there, and CodePen. Once you have this, put it in an event listener for resize in this case, and that's how you make it adjust to the viewport. Now, as I said, you can pass any event or access range into this, so you could pass in scroll events. This uses Chi by Ono type code. It took me longer to figure out what word to put in this than it did for me to actually write the code. Um, but Bloop, I think, nailed it. You can tie it into device orientation. It's funny that my phone is cracked in this, but that wasn't intentional. Um, it's actually way worse now, which is a bit embarrassing. Um, or this one, I love this one, I made this last year. This changes the font weight and a transform of each individual letter. Uh, there's this one, so uh, this wasn't coming up very nice on this projector, but I'll see what it looks like. Yeah, so this one, um, I might tweet the link out so you can see it so it looks better. Um, it's called Whoa by Scribbletone, and it uses uh, mouse position to change the angles and the orientation of the, um, the axes. It's such a cool font. Where's my mouse? There it is. So we've also got one like this. This uses the web audio API, and it listens to the sound of my voice. Um, what I'm going to do before I explain why this is cool is get all of you to go woo. Go. <laughs> Yay. Um, so why I think this is cool, aside from the fact that uh, I like people to woo at me when I'm on stage, um, is that if you think about uh, speech-to-text APIs like or, or um, Google Home, Alexa, those kinds of things, when they convert our speech into text, you kind of lose the tone and the intent of your words. But if we could combine um, variable fonts with web audio and other technologies, we could start to represent what we're saying in much more meaningful ways so we don't lose that tone and intent. So the messages that we send to people through these um, speech APIs can actually convey what we want rather than people maybe misinterpreting what we're saying. So I think that's super cool. I'm just going to stop that so it doesn't keep running in the background. Um, so this one, I'll just get my prop here, my broken phone. Um, this one uses the ambient light sensor. So I just put the light up to my laptop. And this is the same technology that causes your, light, your phone to dim in low light environments. And what is really cool about this is that if you think about the fact that we don't always sit inside an office with perfect lighting, sometimes people are using tablets and moving indoors to outdoors, 
you might want to change the way your text is rendered to um, be more readable. For critical interfaces, you might want to make sure that it's whatever situation they're in, they can read what uh, you want them to see. So sometimes it might need to be heavier rather than really thin. Um, this font's called Tiny, and I just think it's a good demonstration of the effect. So you can make things more usable and more accessible with these kinds of technologies. Or, because this is me, um, you can also create really interesting storytelling. This font's called Blooming GX by Typechua. Arthur, who makes this font, makes the most incredible variable fonts you'll ever see in your life. Um, it actually renders better on Firefox, but the ambient light sensor doesn't work in Firefox, so I couldn't, couldn't show you it there. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity here for creating experiences which allow uh, users to, to experience our website based on their specific circumstance and their specific experience. And I think that's really exciting. Like, we don't have to keep designing things that work a specific way for every person that ever visits our website. We can create something that's just for them in the moment that they're in at the time that they visit our sites. And uh, finally, um, this, Arthur made a Jello font so that you can pat Jello in font form. This is probably the happiest I've ever been in my entire life that my dog now has a font. Absolutely delightful. So it's only because variable fonts give us control over each of these elements that we can fine tune font characteristics to maximize things like legibility, readability, and accessibility of our website text. And I know that some of these examples might seem trivial, but what they are are possibilities. We're demonstrating the options that you have. Variable fonts are still very new, and this is a level of control over our fonts that are unprecedented. We have never been able to do this with actual text. For me, this is an exciting place to be in on the web. We have technology um, developing all the time, new sensors, new APIs, new CSS, new JavaScript, and we have more opportunities than ever to combine create and present content on the web in more creative, more meaningful, more purposeful, and do so in a more performant and accessible way. There's no reason that we can't have all of these things and build amazing experiences for our users. So at the very least, you could create a more performant website just by using a variable font. That's cool. It's also, you know, a little bit boring. But at best, we can do all of these cool, amazing things and start to create websites that are not just for um, everyone to feel the same experience, but to give them something that suits their needs in the moment that they're in right now. And I think that's really exciting, and that's why I get excited about the future of uh, web typography with variable fonts. If you want variable fonts, b-fonts.com is the best resource. Uh, my blog, variablefonts.dev, Hasn't been updated for a while, but I will be doing that again soon. And these are some great people to follow on Twitter. Thank you very much.